Uh, dear viewers, uh, welcome to another episode of a series of discussions called Capitalks, uh, which is organized by a critical monthly journal Capital. And uh, tonight uh, we have a special episode with a cooperation with uh, Eleusina. Eleusina is a cultural center in Banska Stjavnica. And uh, my name is Tomasz Huczko. I am an editor-in-chief of Capital. And today my co-host is Marek Pavlik, uh, the art director of Eleusina. And uh, I must say that we are very pleased and really honored that we have a special guest tonight, as you probably know, because you are watching our event on Facebook. You know, it's uh, Yanis Varoufakis. Yanis Varoufakis is a Greek uh, economist, um, a former academic who lectured uh, as a professor of economy in uh, universities in Britain, Australia, or United States. Uh, he was a Ministry of Finance uh, in the first government of Alexis Tsipras in 2015. He co-founded the grassroots movement, uh, Diem25. And in 2018, he initiated uh, together with the Senator Bernie Sanders, the international platform uh, of the left called um, Progressive International. He's also an author of several books, uh, among uh, others to mention the Talking to My Daughter About Economy or Adults in the Room. Uh, Yanis, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I've only been to Slovakia once. And that was a very long time ago. But our movement that you mentioned so kindly, DiEM25, has a branch there. So I feel that somehow I'm connected. So let's hope uh, one time um, you will uh, visit us personally. Um, we can have uh, a talk uh, on a live. But uh, let's start. We don't have uh, that much time today. Sure. Uh, and uh, we, we ask you to come uh, online and, and talk to you because you have a new book out there. Uh, which is called Another Now. And we both read it with Marek and were quite amazed uh, by the ideas that are expressed in the book. Uh, so today we will concentrate uh, on your book and on the ideas uh, in it. And I must say for myself, I was quite uh, surprised when I started reading it because I was expecting uh, some kind of political treatise or maybe something more autobiographical as your adults in the room. And I was surprised that it is a fiction. It's a piece of fiction. Uh, it's a piece of uh, utopian novel, let's say. Uh, so I wanted to ask, why did you choose this genre, uh, this maybe surprising genre? And uh, if you were uh, influenced maybe by some of the classics uh, of utopian fiction, such as uh, maybe William Morris's uh, News from Nowhere. Of course, of course I am. Uh, William Morris in particular. <laughs> and especially if you look at the subtitle, Dispatches from an Alternative Present, that's, that resonates with news from utopia, from nowhere, no place. Um, the diff the, yes, and, and the, I suspect the, the similarity with w William Morris is that, unlike other utopic books, uh, I tried to write it as a novel, as you said, surprising you and surprising myself, actually. Uh, but it was the only way of writing it. Because, you know, when I wrote books like, you know, The Global Minotaur um, and other such books by which I tried to make sense of what's around us, of reality. Um, it, I find it easy to sit down and put on paper my views on how I think the world works. And I may be wrong in, in my views, but it's not too difficult to sit down and say, okay, this is how the money system works. This is how uh, the stock exchange works. This is how you know, the labor market capitalism works. And this is what I think is the problem with it. But when it comes to trying to imagine an answer to the question that we leftists must have an answer to, but we almost never do, of you know, the question being, okay, mate, if you don't like capitalism, what is the alternative? 
right? Um, when we try to imagine an answer like that, you know, we have to create in our head something that doesn't exist, a kind of democratic socialism, for instance, right? Or, you know, luxurious, uh, technologically advanced communism, whatever you want to call it. You need to, to imagine that. Now, you know, Karl Marx never dared do that. You know, Marx didn't write about communism. You know, he wrote some, you know, his, some throwaway lines that to each according to his uh, capacity, from each according, no, from each according to his, to his capacity, to each according to his need. But yeah, that's a nice slogan. It's, it is no um, um, explanation of how money would work under you know, socialism, for instance, right? And Marx's way of escaping that question was always by saying, oh, the proletariat will have to create that. I'm here to explain um, why capitalism is a dead end and why it will create its own um, crisis. It's a, it, it will undermine itself, therefore paving the ground for you folks to get out there and to work it out how socialism sh should work. But given the experiences of you know, Czechoslovakia, of Eastern Germany, of the Soviet Union, of China and so on, of social democracy, I don't think we leftists have the right to do that which Marx did, to say, well, this is for the people who will build it. We have to inspire ourselves and others with an answer that creates the expectation in our minds that there is something worth fighting for. Now, the problem is, in putting together this blueprint for a socialist democratic society, uh, I found that I disagree with myself. <laughs> you know, I come up with an idea, then I say, no, 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 hang on, this is not right. And then I come up with a second idea, and then I disagree with that as well. And I think that this is right. We should be very skeptical of our utopia, because otherwise it's very easy for a utopia to become a dystopia if we're not skeptical of it. Eh? Because this is not, we're not describing something that exists, we're describing something we want to create. And different people have different views. That's why I was stuck for 20 years. For 20 years, I was refusing to write this book because I did not want to write a blueprint. So this is how this works, and this is how that works, and this is perfect, and if we only do it that way, everything will be fantastic. And the novel came to me because in a novel, you can create... I created three main characters, Costa, Iris, and Eva, um, one of them being, um, you know, um, a neoliberal the other one being a Marxist feminist, the third one being a lefty technologist, right? Um, and each one of them brought a different perspective and, they, and I allowed them to debate amongst themselves, to disagree strongly amongst themselves about what the world should be like. And by staging this debate between them and also throwing events at them, events that force them to make choices, which is what happens in a novel, um, in a proto-novel like mine. Um, they, 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 you know, they had an opportunity to revisit their own views um, in the face of the events that were beyond their control and the choices that they had to make. So you said that you, you, you thought you were going to, re to read an autobiographical book. In a way, you did, because there is part of me in each one of these characters. And I, I, I sympathize with the views of each one of them, even if they're inconsistent. You know, this is why I'm saying that I'm an inconsistent Marxist. Mm. So the, there is a part of you in every, uh, in every character. That's right. You already mentioned these three characters and um, they are communicating together in the form of the platonic dialogues. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one is uh, the anthropologist, uh, the IT uh, engineer and the banker. Why did you choose these particular professions and what do they stand for? What do they represent in the sociocultural? Um... Well, we live in, in, the, in the present where there is a huge clash of ideas, uh, of projects. There is the neoliberal ideology, philosophy, religion, I call it, if you want. It's a story that, you know, we live in the best of all possible worlds. This world may suck may not be a good place, but, you know, any, any, any alternative to it is going to be worse. That the market fails, but the best fix for a failing market is another market, more markets, 
That's the neoliberal religion, right? Philosophy, creed, call it mantra, call it whatever you want. That had to be in the book. It had to be in the book because, um, firstly, it's very interesting. I find it fascinating. Mm. I find the, you know, the libertarian perspective, not so much the establishment perspective, you know, what our government says is not interesting, it's actually very boring and not at all intellectual. But, I, I, you know, I, I've, all my life I've enjoyed a good debate with true blue libertarian thinkers who can be very surprisingly ra radical, uh, even more radical sometimes than many of my leftist Marxist friends. Uh, so I wanted Eva to be there. Also, you know, it's from an autobiographical perspective, perspective, you know, I spent decades teaching in economics departments, not in sociology departments, not in history departments, but in true blue neoliberal, neoclassical, as we call them, uh, economic departments. And I have taught side by side with many of these people, people like Eva. Uh, and so and I've taught their stuff as well. <laughs> I've taught Friedrich von Hayek, I've taught Adam Smith, I've taught, you know, Ludwig von Mises, th those libertarian thinkers. I have given them voice in lectures that I've given to students for years and years and years and years. So that had to be in there. And, you know, the critique of the present by these libertarians is very useful to leftists. And also their critique of socialism back in the 1920s, Remember when, look, uh, um, when Friedrich von Hayek said that the problem with socialists is not that they are bad people, they are very good people. And he actually said they are better people than the rightists. Uh, they want good things. The problem is in order to materialize, to implement socialism, they have to violate their socialist principles. You know, that is a very harsh judgment and a very accurate judgment on us leftists, especially if you think of the Gulag and the Soviet Union and so on. So I wanted, that had to be in there. It had to be there as a perspective on capitalism and also as a critique of the socialist utopia that I was constructing. Mm -hmm. So Eva is there. And the, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. The Ari is a very particular uh, uh, character and uh, you also mentioned at several occasions the name of Rosa Luxemburg. So um, was Iris some kind of avatar of Rosa Luxemburg, like being this kind of epitome for the grassroots democracy and uh, revolutionary Marxism, as opposed to the Lenin's centralism uh, and the, this very um, subordinated uh, form of uh, superpower or structure, power structure. Oh so yes, there's a lot of Rosa Luxemburg in Iris. But Iris, so yeah, there is that, there is, yeah, the libertarian Marxist that Rosa Luxemburg was. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it, 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 the Marxist who took seriously Marx's point that the state should wither and that they, the, 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 the communist um, revolution must be democratic, thinks that Lenin um, did not take so seriously. And we know that from the clash between Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin. So there is a lot of, of, of Rosa Luxemburg in Iris, but there is also a radical feminist. Uh, there is also um, an anarcho-syndicalist in her. And there is also, uh, there is the gay element. Um, there is, you, you know, I've, I've put a number of people that I've come across in my life together. And, you know, there, there, is, um, uh, there was an anthropologist that I met some time ago, many years ago. Uh, who was, uh, who had compiled uh, Cameroonian language uh, dictionaries and grammars, like Iris, who had learned the art of uh, tapestry making from men um, in matriarchal villages in the Cameroon. Uh, now, the problem was that this was a, this was a man, it wasn't a woman, um, but he was, um, in his own words, queer, that is a very f effeminate gay, person, also a social anthropologist from uh, UCL. So, the, 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 you know, there is Luxembourg, this person that I am referring to, this anthropologist, um, the gay liberation person, there are, you know, she's all these people in one, in a sense. And then there is um, the, the, the third person who, is, um, who represents the third strand of modernity's great defeat, because here we have three people representing different facets, strands, dimensions of modernity. You've got the neoliberal 
modernity, which believes that the world will get a, will become a better place, and reason, rationality, and liberty will triumph because of the markets. That's uh, Eva. You've got Iris, who is the left-wing variety of modernity, the Marxist feminist uh, variety of modernity. And then there is Costa, who has a left-wing background, but he got caught up in the digital revolution and in the great early hope that the internet and digital technologies will liberate us. And all three varieties of modernity and these three characters in the end are defeated. Um, our defeat, the left's defeat came in 1991. I don't need to explain more, right? The neoliberal's defeat came in 2008 with the collapse of Wall Street. And even Alan Greenspan, the previous chairman of the Fed coming out and saying my model of the world was disproved as a major, major concession by Alan Greenspan on behalf of the libertarians. And Costa, who realizes that the internet is not liberating us, but it is liberating Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and allows a new kind of techno-feudalism to be built. So he becomes a dissident within the internet, within the digital, digital technologies. Yeah, these are these are all uh, the characters, and they are pretty interesting. But let's get back to the story, at least uh, briefly, for our viewers who didn't have a chance to read the book yet, because uh, so they know what we are talking about. Now, in your book, in this uh, utopian fiction, you present um, a possibility for for your characters to communicate with a different dimension, like a different reality. And uh, in this reality, it's like a post-capitalist reality, right? Where the capitalism ends and uh, a different regime starts. And, uh, and this all happens in the different reality in 2008. I think that's a pretty remarkable date for you. You mention it quite often. And in this, in this uh, reality, in another now, as you call it, um, the world gets a chance after 2008 to, to do it differently, to, 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 to create different structures than we have. So uh, do you think that uh, we had this chance in 2008 and we didn't take the chance? Absolutely. I lament the fact that we missed that chance. 2008 was, uh, I keep saying this again and again and again, it was our generation's 1929. You know, capitalism has ups and downs, but it has had two moments of near failure. One was in 1929, and we know what happened after that, the Second World War and so on. And the other one was 2008. Uh, and we had a movement. We had a global movement after 2008. We had Occupy Wall Street. We had the Indignados in Spain. We had Syriza here in Greece. We took government. I became finance minister. My goodness, you know. That was a major revolution, really. To, through ele the electoral system for somebody like me to become a minister of finance in a Eurozone member state. <laughs> uh, uh, so we had that. We had that in, in Germany. We had it uh, almost everywhere. You saw that the repercussions of that were that in Britain, Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party, not for very long, but he, for a few years. So there was a movement, but we messed up. We did not take advantage of the great um, earthquake that shook um, the, the foundations of capitalism. So for me, this, is like, this book is like saying, okay, what could we have done differently? How could we have won? How could we have changed the world? Uh, so I try to imagine, okay, let's run back, you know, rewind history to 2008. Instead of gathering in squares and having long meetings, that, you know, after a while, you know, we all got really tired and went home or was beaten up by police and went home. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, uh, could we have organized differently, bring together um, new weapons of collective action against the capitalist, not capitalist, the financial class, primarily, not so much the capitalist class. Capitalism was already dying. It was the financiers who remained in power because they ensured that the state funded them and bailed them out at the expense of everybody else. So the book is effectively an alternative history. What would have happened in 2008 had we done things differently? How we would have brought capitalism to its knees by 2012, 2013, and built a post-capitalist 
democratized econo social economy at a global level between 2012, 13, and let's say 2020. Uh, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's fiction, right? It's more or less science fiction, <laughs> political science fiction. But in order to not to write this again as a complete story, I devised this uh, technique. Uh, these friends, Eva, Costa, and Iris, they are in 2025 in San Francisco. There is an, there is a, um, an experiment uh, that, that goes wrong in Costas's high-tech laboratory in San Francisco. And that allows him, through a wormhole, to gain access to himself, right? In an alternative timeline, I imagine that in 2008, the time-space continuum split in two branches. We are in this one, but there was another one, which is what we could have done. And through this wormhole, he, he, Iris, and Eva can communicate with themselves, each one. So, because, you know, in, when it comes to fiction, when it comes to any story, you need constraints that liberate, as, as Wittgenstein put it. So my constraint is that you can only talk to yourself. You can't, you know, you don't have access to their television sets, right? <laughs> you, so it's like you having to talk to yourself in another now to find out from you, from your perspective, um, how the world changed. So I tell the story through this medium of political science fiction. If you want. Mm -hmm. So you are uh, suggesting very uh, radical ideas in your book, like canceling the uh, shareholding, uh, reforming the ownership uh, uh, as we know it, or um, canceling or banning the commercial banks as well as the financial markets. Um, and you are in the same time blaming them uh, for um, the state uh, of uh, our society or civilization we are in, like this kind of uh, patriarchal uh, legacy uh, and uh, the kind of inherent need for the control or to exert control over others. Um, so would you think that like kind of mitigating this multiple institution, completely reforming uh, the whole setup of our uh, economic infrastructure could lead eventually to the reforming or to the reform of the mindset of people? You are also kind of mentioning in, in, in connection with the migration, like could empowering people could like really radically change uh, the, the, um, what we really are as people? Well, I strongly believe so. Uh, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in the hypothesis that it is our circumstances that determine our ideas and not our ideas that determine our circumstances. Of course, our ideas influence the historical process. But there is um, uh, um, a pri the, the primacy of uh, structure over agency. This is what the reason why I remain a, Mar a Marxist. I don't believe that you, you and I can simply suddenly have um, bright ideas and then the, the world changes and capitalism goes away. <laughs> uh, most of what people think is part of their nature is not part of their nature. It is uh, a set of ideas that has been embedded in us as a result of uh, the social relations of production, exchange, distribution. Uh, the, you know, most of the ideas that we have have been created by this structure and the structures that we live in, including um, xenophobia, including the fear of the, of the foreigner, of the migrant, the refugee, and so on. Most people have become in our countries, um, xenophobic, only because they feel that they are themselves either running the risk of becoming refugees in their own countries or they are refugees in their own homes. People feel powerless, and when people feel powerless, then they surrender to somebody's will to power, whether that somebody is Donald Trump, a neo-Nazi, um, um, a xenophobe. So, yes, uh, but let me say that Regarding the, the description I have of the other now, of, 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 of the new regime that um, 
um, in, my, in my imagination has taken place, has, uh, has been formed in the years after 2008. Um, what I wanted to do, I, I wanted to, I experimented with my own thing, with myself. I tried it out on myself. Can I describe an advanced, technologically advanced society without capitalism? And how do I define capitalism? The prevalence of two markets, the labor market, the labor contract, a contract between somebody who owns but does not work into a company and somebody who works into a company but doesn't work, own it. Yeah, this division creates a very strange contract between non-working employers and working non-owners. Uh, can you have a situation where that is not the case? And secondly, can you do away with the financial system, with the private financial sector? These two, the combination of the labor contract and the financial market is what makes capitalism capitalism. I don't want to do away with robots. I don't want to do away with technology. I do not want to do away with artificial intelligence. I do not want to do away with the internet. I do not want to do away with uh, progress, with, uh, you know, um, uh, with markets. Um, uh, uh, but can I do away, can, can capitalism die, whereas while society is progressing faster and becoming democratized? That's a question. So I tried to create in the book, as you, you, because you very kindly read it, uh, an alternative corporate law what would corporate law be like? So the idea there is that everybody working in a corporation has one share in the corporation that gives them one vote, and that share is not tradable. You, you take it, you get it when you're hired, and you have to surrender it when you leave. And if you don't work in the company, you don't have it. Uh, and if you have a central bank that provides digital bank accounts to everyone, in, suddenly you do not have the private banks creating 97% of money in society. So suddenly money is socialized. Businesses are socialized, money is socialized. Then there are other chapters on chapters or segments on how do we decide um, um, about migration, who moves into our cities. I take away the power of the state to decide uh, uh, which migrants or refugees each community welcomes. I give this to uh, the citizens of a community. Uh, land is socialized. You divide it between commercial zones and social zones, but it is citizens' assemblies that are drawn by lot, not by election, because elections always favor the oligarchy, whereas lotteries do not favor anyone by definition. Thus, the jury system. So, and then on top of that, I have grafted an international financial system that um, is automated, it is digital, uh, and it does not prioritize rich countries over poor countries. Indeed, what it does is it funds the poorer countries, green investment projects by stabilizing imbalances both in trade and in capital movements. So it's, you know, I try to, in a, in a short novel, to, to, to create a, a genuinely alternative, uh, technologically advanced society with markets, but not with capitalism. Yeah, as you have, as you have described, uh, it's a really a radical change and it's a radically different society. But there is one thing that remains and that it's patriarchy, as you say, in the other now. Why is that? Why, why everything else changes, but part, patriarchy remains? Well, I, I'm the son of my mother and the grandson of my grandmother. And, you know, what these two remarkable women, I have to give them credit for that, have taught me ever since I was very young. Uh, my grandmother was a suffragette feminist in the 1920s and suffered for it. My mother was a feminist in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And what they taught, they taught me was that the, the, that the Marxists, the left, are wrong when they say that um, you know, once capitalism goes away, patriarchy goes away and, and, and feminism is no longer necessary. They taught me that from, the, from a very early stage, that this is so deeply ingrained in, you know, because it's not just connected to capitalism. Patriarchy and the exploitation of women as 
Friedrich Engels said, it's the oldest class struggle, right? <laughs> um, that between uh, male owners and female non-owners, the domestic slavery that Engels so beautifully described, that this has been going on for so, so many um, centuries that it is not something that we will do away with just because we do away with financial markets and labor markets. Uh, it's a hard cockroach to kill, as I say in the book, or Iris says in the book. Um, and, you know, I remember when I was young and participating in left-wing organizations and there were feminists who were coming in and there were men saying, oh, come on, look, let's, let's, we need to prioritize. First, we do away with capitalism and then there will be no problem. I never believed that. My mom and my grandma taught me that this is bullshit. You will, you will excuse my French. Uh, so I had to put it in there. And Iris is the best person to uh, make the point. Uh, the, you can see that it's quite sad, isn't it? The, I mean, I, I have come to know left-wing parties very well from within. They're some of the most patriarchal, uh, misogynic organizations in the history of the world. And, and the tragedy is that the comrades who are patriarchal in their behavior don't know that Uh, we might have a technical problem. Uh -huh. we, ah, okay, you're back. Okay, we <laughs> had lost you for a second. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can we can hear you. Uh, in your book, uh, you are presenting some concept uh, which uh, deal with uh, shifting. Um, the decision making um, to the actual workers or people uh, but uh, with the power or empowerment it goes hand um, in hand uh, with shifting the responsibility and taking the accountability for the risk uh, and also it kind of um, imposes uh, uh, responsibility for an active uh, citizenship uh, so, do you think the people are ready to be really uh, active, to become active agents in the civic affairs? Like, are we really zone politicians uh, by nature? Because we already, you know, got used to uh, uh, the certain, uh, you know, modus vivendi. You know, there was always someone who took uh, care of the things. You know, it was always kind of we were. Um, we, were, we were not uh, handling the responsibility. Mm. And now you are giving the responsibility to the people. How will they cope with it? Oh, brilliantly. I'm a very, I, 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 that, that's not the problem. Uh, the problem is not how would they cope with the responsibility if, you, if they have it. The problem is how do you convince them that it's worthwhile rebelling in order to acquire it. These are two different problems. Uh, most people have uh, lost faith in politics in the, on, on the left. In the left, the left has been hugely discredited as a result of the experiences of the Soviet Union and East, you know, Eastern Europe. Uh, they've been, the left has been even more discredited in the West through social democracy because social democrats effectively sold out to financial capital. Every generation of, since in the 1970s uh, has been expecting their children to have a worse life than they did. So, you know, the, the, the dream of prosperity that um, was growing up until the 1970s uh, went away and people are just scared. You know, fear is the worst guide to progressive politics. Uh, they're just scared, they, are, they feel helpless. And in that environment, they think that the best they can do is keep their heads down and find ways of attaining personal happiness within this uh, archipelago of gloom. Uh, especially now with the pandemic, but even before the, the, the pandemic, with the Euro crisis before that. There's been, a, you know, ever since I was a young man, 
the one crisis, especially after the end of Bretton Woods in the early 1970s, um, every generation of middle class people um, in Europe and in the United States, I'm not talking about China, expected things to get worse. So when you expect things to get worse, you try to find an, an oasis of personal happiness. So you privatize your fears and you privatize your hopes. And you try to you and, and you became you become apolitical, you become depoliticized. So there is a parallel process. Politics is becoming depoliticized and technocratized by you know the oligarchy, the techno-feudal authorities. And individuals depoliticize their own sphere, their own polis. Uh, and this means that. They don't want the responsibility. Why, you know, why have responsibility if you don't have prospects? So this is the problem. If they do find themselves in a position of responsibility, suddenly they become reinvigorated, reactivated, re-energized, and capable of producing miracles. In, uh, in your book, you also bring up an interesting concept of the power of many and... Uh... You are talking about the day of inaction, and mm -hmm. this is a concept that you actually realize uh, in our now. I have, uh, I have uh, within the Dime Twenty Five. Uh, can you can you say something about this? Yeah, um, in the book, I have a chapter in which I I try to explain how the revolution took place in the other now. So, who were the agents of change? Uh, they were not just trade unions because trade unions are too weak today to do, to affect change on their own. It was a combination of financial engineers, of you know, who were burnt in 2008, banding together to bring down Wall Street uh, and to bring capitalism down. Uh, trade unions, of course, um, but also consumers. And these uh, uh, tech rebels um, organized consumer boycotts. And if you think about it today, the, the, the more you have consumption being centralized on platforms like Amazon, the easier it is to attack them through a consumer boycott. And what occurred to me at some point, some time ago, was that if you think about it, in the 19th century, when the first trade unions were created, the modus vivendi of a trade union was based on massive personal sacrifice for very little personal gain. So if you're a worker in a you know, coal mine in the 19th century or in a factory in the 1920s and you go on strike, you suffer massive costs. You have to excuse me for that. You, you suffer massive costs at a personal level. You, you don't put food on the table because you don't get a wage while you're on strike. So your, your, your family suffer, suffers, uh, you can be beaten up, you can be imprisoned, you can be victimized, you can be fired, a uh, huge personal cost to participate in a strike. And even if you get a pay rise, it's very small relative to what you've suffered personally. And the pay rise goes to even those who broke the strike, not just to you. <laughs> so, you know, this, is, this was always very tilted against activists. Whereas today with Amazon, if we want to make Amazon pay, which is one of the progressive international uh, uh, campaigns, which will start again, by the way, in a, few, in a couple of months, um, all you need to do is convince people not to buy, not to visit Amazon's uh, website for a, for a day. That's not a great sacrifice. You don't lose anything. Or you can ask people not to pay their water bill for a week, to delay it by a week. It's no skin of their nose, really. So, but if, if you've got millions doing that, the system comes tumbling down. So that's the day of inaction. This is the, the whole concept of reversing the balance between costs and benefits of the activists. Lilipatian, tiny little costs for the activists, but because there are many, with the use of technology, huge costs for the, you know, the, the, the feudal lords of today's capitalism. Uh, I would like to touch on another topic, a little different one. But it might be interesting, especially because we are talking now from Slovakia, a post-socialist country. 
And uh, we have our own uh, experience with uh, nationalization of land. And that is something that happens in, in, your, uh, in your story in Other Now, uh, that the land become, becomes a common good and is nationalized. Like, what would you say to, to, to a person from, from post-socialist country who might uh, be very skeptical about, about the prospect of nationalization? Well, that I'm not proposing nationalization. I'm proposing uh, communal, communalization or socialization. It's not a state that takes over the land in my book. Remember, every prefecture, every region is running its own business. It's not a state that comes and takes your land and says, okay, you can stay there, you've got to go somewhere else. No, it is the community uh, that decides amongst themselves which part of the land to be commercial, which part of the land to be social, which part of the social land should be social enterprises, which part of the land should be social housing, and how to distribute the more um, popular parts of the land, you know, buildings, apartments, uh, plots, and so on, between themselves. Uh, and to do this, not with, through elections or through a party system, it's not a communist party that comes and tells you what is what, no. It is citizens' assemblies that are selected through sortition, through random lots. Either you have that, which is, you know, um, the opposite of the market, but also at the same time, the opposite of the state. Or you're going to end up, if you don't have nationalization, which I'm not supporting, you're going to have the tyranny of the market. So you're going to end up with money buying the land. So if you don't have money, you're stuffed. You know, you, are, you, you become essentially um, a slave of the banker. Because the only way, um, you know, the only way to buy a flat, if you're a young person in, person in um, you know, Bratislava, wherever, is to become a, a debt slave. That's the only way of becoming, of ever getting ahead. So you know, do you want the tyranny of the banker? Or do you want the democracy of uh, a community which through a jury system creates rules and regulations for dividing <laughs> land between people? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I must. I'm, I'm just uh, want to say that in the beginning, uh, Yanis told us he has only 45 minutes because he's got a lot of work for the parliament, and it's almost up. Um, so I just want to uh, ask if we can have maybe one more question. Sure, sure, okay. of course. Let's so have another. Marek, Marek, yeah, if you. Yeah. Anyway, um, you have a very nice uh, concept of uh, love uh, being a kind of um, opposite to the free market. And um, it, the, it kind of uh, reminded me the book of Alan Badio, the classical book, and um, where falling in love is, uh, is um, something uh, which implies the surrendering uh, of the control over the other person. Yeah. And uh, uh, what is uh, kind of epitome uh, when I connect it to our uh, Czechoslovak context, uh, Václav Havel um, became president uh, of Czechoslovakia um, uh, with the words or with the slogan that love and goodness will prevail over uh, the, the evil and hatred. So would you say that um, slashing the ownership will trigger some kind of agape or um, you know, like this very essence of love. Excellent question. E excellent question. Go straight to my heart, your question. Uh, look, um, the, the problem with Václav Havel's um, beautiful in sentiment was that he was saying this at the time when capital and financial capital was taking over. Uh, the chances of love and agape taking over when financial capital is taking over, the chances of that are zero. <laughs> zero. Uh, it's a good sentiment, but it is pie in the sky. Uh, that's utopic. Uh, will, uh, okay, so let me answer your question directly without a prologue. Ending private ownership of means of production, of corporations, ending uh, oligarchic election 
systems and ending for the finan private financial markets is a prerequisite for love to take over. It's not a guarantee. It is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition. That's, the, you know, that's the message of my book. Uh, my, might I end up with a quick one? Because uh, sure. um, you also uh, touch on the Corona crisis already in the book, uh, because characters already know about this pandemic. And uh, in, in the other dimension, they, uh, you say they would uh, treat the pandemic differently and probably much better. Uh, yeah. What would you say now, what, what, for us, what would be the advice, uh, what to do better in the pandemic um, than we are doing right now? Well, I mean, let me give you a very, very practical example, right? I mean, yeah, Slovakia is part of the Eurozone. Greece is part of the Eurozone. Uh, what has happened in the last year is that our central bank, the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, has printed 1.7 trillion euros in order to create a stimulus for the pandemic, to you know, lift all boats or prevent them from, from sinking during the pandemic, the economic pandemic, right? That has failed abysmally. Abysmally. Why? Because the central bank prints the money and gives it to private banks. Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, Santander, right? Your banks. They give it to them. Now, these bankers, private bankers, they need to make money out of it. So they look at you folks, me, yeah, and say, ah, 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 we're not lending them the money because, you know, they have none. And they are not doing really very well. And, you know, demand for goods and services, employment... So as if we're going to give the money to little people. So the, the large private banks take the central bank money, okay, and they take it to Volkswagen. They take it to Siemens. They take it to Alstom, right, to Renault. Now, these companies are already sitting on a lot of cash. And they are not investing because for the same reason, they look at you and they say, ah, as if they're going to buy an expensive electric car like Tesla, right? So we're not going to build one. So they take the money from the private bank that is staying it from the European Central Bank, And you know what they do. They go to the stock exchange and they buy back their own shares. So share prices go up. Markets are doing really very well, financial markets, but the rest of society suffers. This is what has been happening during the pandemic in the last year. Right? In the other now, there are no private banks. The central bank is there. You have an account with the, private, with the central bank. All of us. Marek has one. I have one. You have one. All of us have one. If the central bank wanted to refloat us, they would put, you know, 5,000 euros in each bank account. Your bank account, my bank account, and then we would pay one another and we'll be refloated. And then there would be production. So this is how the, you know, my other now would uh, respond far more efficiently, not just fairly, efficiently, to the pandemic than, you know, this messy... Uh, private banking system that we have, which creates huge returns for the parasites and no um, serious economic dynamism for the many. Um, yeah, let's hope uh, we can get to some other now, to some better world. We would really need it right now, <laughs> probably all of us. Uh, I must say, I'm very sorry for our um, viewers online because they sent us questions, but... Uh, We thought we would have uh, much, much more time. No, why don't you select two? And yeah, I will would you? Answer. Select two. Okay, two okay. Of the questions that you got. And That's great. Or maybe three, but tell me all three of them at once so I can answer all three in one go. Okay, give me a second. Uh, I didn't expect we will uh, answer them. Uh, does Mr. Marufa Varoufakis believe there exists the possibility of successfully selling progressive social and economic politics in our environment. Mm -hmm. Good one. Next one. Okay. The history of Europe has a concept of ownership, which is not necessarily a priori to human beings as evidenced by indigenous societies. Mm -hmm. This informs a belief which makes other ideologies as alternatives to capitalism very difficult to acquire. How does one go about modifying this narrative? Maybe these two, if you can. Okay. Um, let's start from the first one. Um, 
you know, when the crisis started in 2010 here in Greece, uh, the party that in the end I won government with, we had a 4%, 3.5% in, in the general election. Within a few years, we went to 40% and we won government. So it's possible. The tragedy was that we betrayed those people because the government surrendered. But it is, this is just a simple, an example of how from one moment to the other, uh, I mean, you, you experienced that in your part of Europe, how quickly the Soviet system collapsed when nobody believed it would collapse, especially the CIA. You know, the CIA was co caught completely unaware by the collapse of the Soviet system and satellites. So, you know, um, it is only in the deepest, darkest moment of the night that light surprisingly shines through. So, you know, um, and, and let's not forget that it's not you and me who are going to create the circumstances for light to come in. It's capitalism itself, which is undermining itself. This is the, the great lesson from Marx, that it's not the left that is undermining capitalism. Capitalism is undermining capitalism. What we have a duty to do is to be ready for that moment when the first rays of light shine through, uh, that we uh, take advantage. Uh, the second question about ownership, right? Again, it is capitalism that is depriving the many of their ownership rights that it promises them. I mean, I don't know exactly what's happening in Slovakia today, but here in Greece, for instance, out of a, you know, what we have like, something like 5 million families, 1.2 million are now facing uh, eviction. They are facing foreclosure of their homes by the banks and the, the funds that have purchased their non-performing loans. You see that throughout the developed world, you've got the dispossession of the middle class by the financial sector. You know, the, the, the American dream came to, to, to Europe in the form of mortgages, credit cards, and all that, and now it's becoming a nightmare. The youngsters of the world do not have any aspirations to serious ownership. You know, their, their precarious jobs, even if they work 20 hours a day, are simply incapable of producing ownership rights for them. So, uh, and if you combine this fact with the, with, with the reality that um, Europeans and Aborigines in Australia and Aborigines in Canada were far better off before they had private property <laughs> because they had common lands and life was much more pleasant. I mean, it was, it was brutish and it was, uh, it, it was backward, but at least, you know, they didn't stay up at night wondering how they will pay their mortgage the next day. So, you know, I, I lived for many years in, in Britain and in Australia and the United States, and they keep talking as if they are homeowners, these people, and they don't own anything. They, all they own is a loan uh, to a bank, you know, provided by a bank, a debt to a bank. So they're slaves of a bank, but sad, sad, you know, they, they talk themselves, talk, talk, speak to, of themselves as homeowners. You know, I think that the circumstances are ripe for a rethink of the constituents of happiness and, and, and of autonomy. You're not autonomous if you owe huge quantities of money to a bank. You're not. You're the worst kind of slave. You're a very sad slave. Maybe very last question. Do you already have an idea for another book? Or is something being conceived? Look, I want to continue writing novels like this one, but it's not going to be my next one. I need to have a break from this. Uh, so the next one is going to be a short book, which I've called Seven Myths, Seven, seven Myths, um, where I'm concentrating on seven very um, widely accepted ideas which are all false and need to be exposed. That will be a very short book, but the next one is going to be another novel like this one, only because I really enjoyed writing it. <laughs> yeah, and we enjoyed reading it. 
Uh, so I must say you. to all our viewers, uh, please uh, do read uh, Yanis's book. It's a, it's a really good and inspirational in these times. And uh, let's hope we will talk to you again about your next books. Thank you. you will again of course. Uh, be so kind and accept our invitation. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And thank you for reading the book. Because, you know, for an author to have his book read, especially when the author is not a fiction writer, and I, you know, I took a major, major gamble by writing a piece of fiction because I had no idea whether I could do it. <laughs> no idea whether I could do it. So it was a major risk, a gamble. Yeah, and thank you for sharing it. Worth it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank have you. a good day. Good and evening. Good bye. Send me a link of this. I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing it again. I, we will. Bye.